Um, good afternoon. My name is Jamu Fernandez, currently a doctoral candidate at the Australian National University. So while Rafael talked about the, uh, the invalidity of the Philippines withdrawal wall from the Rome Statute in view of the country's municipal law, what I would delve into is that it's the question of its effectiveness, effectiveness under international law. Now, not much ink has been spilled on the topic, and we can count on a few who have considered the issues, such as Professor Maria Franskowska in 1975, and recently by Professor Hannah Wooliver. However, considering the implications of the issue, we think, uh, we think that it deserves fresh consideration. Um, the VCLT provides the detailed guidance concerning the conclusion of treaties. Under Article 27, the binding force of a treaty is determined solely by international law. And in turn, this entails that its, ex its, ex its execution cannot depend on the internal law of the parties to the agreement. Yet the rule admits an exception by expressly stating that the provision is without prejudice to Article 46. The reference to this article means that a state has the right to invoke the nullity of a treaty due to a manifest breach of a provision of its internal law of fundamental importance concerning the, uh, the competence for the conclusion of, uh, of treaties. The provision strikes a bal delicate balance between two competing norms of internet, uh, two, two competing norms. On the one hand, it seeks to secure the security of international agreements, and on the other hand, the respect for internal regulations of the state concerning its treaty-making power, in turn considered to be an expression of a state's sovereignty. To the constitutionalist, a state may not be bound in, mat in matters affecting its vital interests by acts for which it, there is no authority under its own law. To the internationalists, the security of international law agreements would be in danger if parties or treaties were unable to rely on this ostensible authority of organs accepting binding obligations on behalf of their state. After successive rapporteurs, the issue was finally settled by agreeing on a compromise that protected the security of treaties while recognizing the sovereignty of states, as can be gleaned from the relationship between Articles 27 and 46. However, while the BCLD provides detailed guidance concerning the conclusion of treaties, the same is not true for uh, their denunciation. The convention provides extensive provisions on the grounds of processes, on grounds and effects of withdrawals. However, it is silent as to the question of by whom must the act be made. Now, this is unfortunate considering that decisions to denounce treaties, as in the case of joining them, are acts of national sovereignty that must be examined. In this regard, it may be claimed that ample authority exists to say that an invalid withdrawal under municipal law, by reason of lack of competence, makes the withdrawal ineffective under international law, considering the text of, one, of, uh, of the convention and the intentions of the drafters as called from the travaux preparatoire. For one, support may be found through the, the interpretation of the VCLT's provision. Now, Article 2 sets out, Article 2C sets out the definition of full powers, which calling from the intention of the drafters should be applied to both Article 7 pertaining to the requirement of production of full powers in the context of conclusion of agreements, and Article 67 concerning the termination of withdrawal from treaties. Notably, full powers under Article 2 refers to instruments for expressing the consent of the state to be bound by a treaty or for accomplishing any other act with respect to a treaty. As the rule prescribed, the, uh, as the, rule prescribed the conditions under which a person is considered to be with an authority to perform acts in relation to a treaty, the restriction on the authority should apply to acts concerning its termination. Thus, an agent of a state must have full powers to be able to denounce a treaty. The records of the convention similarly events the question concerning the competence to denounce treaties was at least determined, at least considered, during its drafting stages. However, draft, uh, the developments that occurred afterwards appear to have overtaken these concerns. Nevertheless, the form of proposals appears to subscribe, subscribe to the mirror principle. The, uh, this principle puts forward that the act of withdrawing from a treaty is a derivative act of its conclusion. As it is a product of a process, logically the manner of denunciation should likewise match the procedure of acceptance of a treaty. Thus, if the convention allows for a narrow exception in reverting to municipal law in cases of competence to conclude a treaty, the same should be applied to competence to denounce the same. However, we believe that there is a higher reason for this. There is evidently a gap, as in most cases in international law, that has to be filled. On the one hand, 
it can be argued that there is no provision governing the effectiveness of treaty withdrawals done in contravention of municipal law. It is beyond its purview. On the other hand, it can be equally asserted that states no longer operate within a lotus-like presumption where the conduct of states are governed by express constraining rules. Accordingly, a resort to principles and underlying policies is warranted. The design of the convention's provision as to the conclusion of treaties was made with the policy of striking a balance on the one hand, security of treaties, and on the other hand, the sovereignty of states. Consequently, a state may not renounce its freely contracted obligations unless it violates a municipal law of fundamental importance. None of these principles are upheld by the application of a purely internationalist view in the case of competence to denounce a treaty. Such an interpretation gives an agent of a state an unfettered authority to withdraw the respective state from treaties without considering whether it is in accord with the intent and the interests of the withdrawing state manifested through its internal processes. Thus, there appears to be just no justification in policy for providing safeguards to treaty-making power of state organs in the conclusion of treaties, but disregarding the same for the purpose of denunciation. So this is the argument we put forward by looking first in terms of the text of the treaty, the, the, the considerations during its drafting, and finally, the policy provision between securing a, securing, securing a balance between the security of treaties and the sovereignty, sovereignty of states. Um, this concludes our presentation.